Just wanted to make sure that worked. <laughs> so you're going to play a little bit today. Uh, whatever you need. You you had some questions for me that I, I got, brought along. I got lots of questions. I got lots of questions for you. How's that? Stratotone or whatever this thing is called. And in the background, you can see the Vox amplifier. So I thought that'd be an unusual combination for you. Yeah, and you got a Brooklyn shirt on. Ah, uh, my hometown. There you go. Well, that's that was going to be my first question. Where did you grow up? Um, my first formative years were in New York City. My father was a New York fireman. And just as I was maybe around middle school age, he started drawing circles on the map 150 miles away from New York. What are you doing, Dad? And he said, New York can't grow that far, son. It goes through. The line goes through Springfield, and I said, what's a Springfield? And he said, you'll find out. Get in the car. And off we went to the wonders of Western Massachusetts. And you never, you never went back to New York? Uh, that was a scouting trip, but we moved shortly after that. Uh, I've been back down to visit, although most of my relatives are no longer there. My daughter, Caitlin, teaches in Brooklyn now. Shout out to Caitlin. That's great. Um, oh, while I think of it, John, shout out to Big Dog O'Callaghan. You know him? Are you on his? He has this. I, I don't. I don't sign about him. the blues. Big Dog's blues juke. No, nope. uh, I'm sure he's promoting your show today. Um, shout out to him. Shout out to Debbie Carlson, who's the admin of that page, and is now trying to get me to play in Wales. However, that's not the whales on the other side of the ocean. That's Wales, Massachusetts. You didn't even know there was a whales. I, I, <laughs> I'm going to ask well, you. Uh, there almost isn't. It's little. Uh, it makes gonna, Sunderland look like the big city. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about Sunderland, where you live. Sunderland is about 4,000 people. Maybe a little more when UMass is full, but right now UMass is like a quarter full or something because so it's not far from northampton basically no nope, we're in between in between uh amherst and northampton sort of and i used to go out and in in uh camp at a, at a campground in florida massachusetts oh yeah florida is a little bit west of us up route two uh james cotton used to play in florida i think did he uh one time when he uh, when I still had my restaurant, he and the boys came in and got lunch on their way to play in Florida. So, Kenny Johnson lived in Greenfield for a while, which is another couple towns north of me. And what's the, the closest city to you is Northampton? I guess big you city. consider Northampton a city, yes. A big um, city. Adams is further west, right? Yeah, quite a bit further west, although I think when my son was playing – uh, Cal Ripken, we went out to a tournament maybe in Williamstown by Williams College, and there were teams from Adams, there were teams from Vermont, teams from New York State, because they're right by all those border lines. So growing up, what type, what type of music were you listening to? What were your parents listening to? Um, dad, dad and mom, you know, were Lawrence Welk generation. But my father was trying to learn to play the piano late in life, and he would occasionally play something with a few blues notes in it, like uh, Dark Town Strutter's Ball or uh, Smoke Gets in Your Eyes, like something like that. So I did hear, hear those notes. They tell me when I was a baby, if I was not going to sleep when I was supposed to and crying, they would put me in the car and ride around till Nat King Cole came on. Wow. Like that, you know, in the sharp suit, like they could deal with that. And uh, that would make me calm down and go to sleep when, when Nat King Cole came on. That's great. So how'd you get into the blues? Like a lot of guys, you know, the Beatles and then Clapton and then Hendrix. When I started taking actual guitar lessons, the guy giving me lessons was in high school, the same as I was. And so after the first, I don't know, eight months or so, it wasn't really guitar lessons anymore. It was, hey, 
how does Hendrix get that sound on Foxy Lady? And what kind of amplifier do you think I should buy? And, uh, you know, uh, who's this guy, Alvin Lee, and how come he can play so fast? And the lessons kind of went, took a rock and roll turn at that point. Wow. Then I found out that real blues guys would come out to Western Mass during that boom, you know, uh, where, where all the college kids were into blues. Uh, there were a couple of places out here. The Rusty Nail was in Sunderland. Uh, Bonnie Raitt would play there. Uh, Cotton would play there all the time. Muddy played there. I think Bruce Springsteen played there, but I wasn't into rock and roll enough to go to that one. But uh, Matt Guitar Murphy, John Lee Hooker, I played with the hook there. Uh, so they would have all the blue shows, and there was a place – right near Mount Holyoke College that had, uh, I saw the Magic Sam band with no Sam. Sammy had, had left us, but it was all the other guys. Uh, Mighty Joe Young was, was the front man. And I realized that these guys would have rock and roll bands opening for them from here. And I'm like, well, hell, I could do a better job opening for those guys. And I tell the story of James Cotton coming up to me one night in Wheatley, Mass. Look up where that is. Uh, with like six hot dogs in his hand. And he said, these are for your band. And I said, they said we couldn't have any of the hot dogs. He says, yeah, well, they're not going to fire me over this. But I went to get my check and I saw yours. Your band must be starving to death. <laughs> you put something to eat. But I was just... You know, the first time I played with him, I thought, oh, wait till the old man sees what I can do. And it took them about 30 seconds to destroy me. Like, I was like, oh, this must be how blues is supposed to work. Later on, I played with Kenny Johnson, who was his drummer. And I would ask him questions about how Cotton arranged songs and stuff. And he would tell me, oh, when we left Chicago, that was a plain old shuffle. And then we got bored and we put in that part and the other part. And the third part. And I thought he was just, you know, stringing me along at first. But as I got more into the blues, I realized that that probably is how they did it. it actually, if you go back and look at some of his early videos, you'll see the songs way plainer than they eventually became when they had uh, when they had uh, Matt Murphy and and uh, George Gregory. George Gregory was from Northampton, played sax with Cotton for a long time. And Captain Z. But he had that great band with Calmisi and and Kenny Johnson. And then Kenny fell in love with a girl in Greenfield and lived out here. And I played with him a, a few times. So let's talk about, you know, you, you grew up, you played blues, you opened for some of these guys. I'm going to ask you more questions about, about that period. But I want to ask you about blues in, the, in, in central Massachusetts, western Massachusetts. And how much, you know, I learned a lot from you. <laughs> and I mean, I'm on the east side of the state. You're on the western side, central yep. and western side. And I didn't realize the depth of, of blues musicians that are out in your area until I spoke to you. And then that opened the door to a bunch of bands, the King Snakes uh -huh. and Blue yep. Honey and you name it. What is that? Is there... I'm surprised you guys don't have your own little society in Western Mass, or do you? Um, you know Katie Wright from WMUA, right, John? I've been yeah, plugging you, her you, for years to you, be the president of our you, society, but she wants nothing to do with you. She's at UMass Amherst. At UMass, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, but when the Blues went through, there were a whole bunch of guys here. I was living in Springfield at the time. Actually, I was living southwest of there by the Congamon Lakes. And uh, so I knew there were blues guys in Northampton, but I didn't really know them well. And when I moved up here, um, I'm walking around Northampton, and I would hear blues coming out of like an apartment building, and I would go up and see who it was. Stuart James one time and his brother were rehearsing their band up in one of the apartments. As I'm walking around, I'm playing a gig in downtown Northampton. Ed Vadas. Um, oh, I remember him. Ed, God yeah, rest Ed. his soul. What a great. <laughs> God what rest a, his soul. Art Steele. 
Art like, Steele. God rest his soul. Um, and then there were the later guys. You know, you've met uh, Automatic Slim. Yep. And Blue Honey and Charlie, uh, the King Snakes and uh, the Reprobates, like they're from Orange. You know, like we think of that as being east of us, but it's pretty much Western Mass to you. Well, it's it's only west a little of, it's, east of it's, us. Yeah, it's west of Gardner. Yeah. Or, right. Uh, or, yeah, right. west of Gardner, not too far. West of Gardner. Gardner. Well, um, do you remember a band from out here? It was a rock band called Fat. Yeah. They had an album on uh, RCA. They yep. toured with the Jefferson Airplane for one tour. And then they kind of hung around the local area playing. Well, Guy DeVito that played bass for them subbed with my band a couple times. And he came to me and he said, the places you play here in Western Mass, those are not blues places. A blues band can't play those places. Now I understand why you're standing on your head trying to entertain people and tell some funny stories and climb on the tabletops and let them play your guitar because you're an entertainer. You would never survive playing blues in these places here. We just don't have enough blues places anymore. Now, when I come out to your part of the world, to the Bull Run or the Gardner Ale House, or when I used to go out to Greendale's in Worcester, the blues people there are like, whoa, what's all this extra energy? But I have to do that here to keep my audience awake. My audience here is half <laughs> of those kids. And, uh, you know, they have no interest in stupid songs from 100 years ago that came up from the Mississippi River. They have, you know, but if you could get them dancing and, and a little bit excited. And then the older people here, we have blues fans here, don't get me wrong, but not like out, I think the Jay Giles band maybe uh, galvanized Central Mass, Eastern Mass years ago, like with a blues audience that's never going to go away. So we love coming out there to see, you know, your folks. Was that a good enough answer? That's a that's a good answer, real good answer. <laughs> I'm full of good answers, and many so, of them are true. Why don't we get you to play a little bit before we play something? I talk some more? Yeah. Um, uh, one of my avid crazed fans, Lori Turjan. Uh, the husband's in the hospital, and they say he's not coming home for a while. I'm going to play my uh, – this is on the new record, but it kind of retroactively, something I've played for years, just seemed appropriate to the situation. Mm -hmm. to work this morning my foreman looked me in the eye he said i don't know what's wrong with you young man you look sick enough to die he sent me to the company doctor and he examined me from head to toe Said, whatever is wrong with the young man, my x-rays just won't show. I cried, angel of mercy. Won't you please look down on me? Angel of mercy. It's all that I need. You know the finance company <laughs> is trying to cheat my check. They say they don't get a payment by Friday. They're taking all the furniture back. Went down to the credit union, try to get me a loan. They said we would let you have it, young man, but 
We hear you whooping. Working here much longer. I cried, Angel of Mercy. Won't you please look down on me? Angel of Mercy. Set the furniture outdoors. I haven't listened to the weatherman a while ago. He says it's going to rain and snow. Well, my daughter's got pneumonia. My son is down with the flu. My whole family is suffering from that minus nutrition. Can't even pull them through. I cried, Angel of Mercy. To please look down on me. Angel of Mercy. Baby, that's all that I need. That comes hey, straight on that record you got there. Yeah, it does, uh, isn't it, huh? Can't fall off the floor. Hey, and it did snow the other day here. I don't know if it did out where you it, live. It did a little bit. <laughs> we had fake spring and then second winter or whatever. Well, um, let's talk about your blues jam on Sunday. you had on Sunday nights in North yeah. Hampton. Yeah, I still get calls about that. It's been a few years since I hosted that, but I hosted a blues jam in Northampton for about five years. And uh, a lot of good players who knew me from, you know, my years and years of playing around the area would come out. And I'd have a featured guest. I copied that from the jams out in Eastern Mass and Central Mass. Uh, the Greendales won, the one at Dunny's. I used to occasionally take a trip out to see uh, those guys, right? Uh, Jim Perry and um, Paul Provost. And... Uh, so I kind of modeled my thing on that. I'd have a featured guest each week. Sometimes guys from, from Eastern Mass would come out. Uh, but a lot of times it'd be, you know, Art Steele or uh, Emily. You know, that would allow me to sneak Emily on, onto the stage. And then I would get, you know, all the amateur musicians, and I would kind of mix and match them and try to make a, a show that would work. And, uh, you know, I occasionally... So so one night, one night, a bass player showed up at your jam. Yes. Yes. Okay. The whole time, when you host a blues jam, you think, oh, probably I'll meet every musician in my area, and a lot of people who are looking to latch on will come in. But very few, you know, it's either people that are working, and I got a lot of those, which was great because they are real good, uh, or it's people who are just starting out 
who are trying to find their way. And I'm not making fun of those people because I was that. You know, I went through a stage where it would take me half an hour to set all the little knobs on my amplifier just right now. You could hand me somebody else's guitar and say, play three songs and I'd be fine. Um, but one night a bass player, a woman bass player sat in and she was good, you know, and it was her first time and she just moved to Northampton. So I went up and I was going to, you know, say some encouraging things. She she had a Fender Precision bass with her, which is kind of a, you know, standard bass that you should have in a recording studio. A lot of times, you know, whatever you usually use, they'll say, here, try playing a Precision. So she, I talked to her about that. And she said to me, um, I just moved here from Chicago <laughs> and I only like blues. Are there any bands around here that play that? And I said, dude, you're hurting me in my heart now. <laughs> Haven't you been listening? Yeah. So uh, that was Kathy Peterson. And she's pl been playing with me now for about four years. Although I got to point out, lest I offend Dave Kandarian, that Kathy went back to work during the pandemic as a doctor and hasn't been available. So DK from Sturbridge, you must know him. Dave I Kandarian. know him. Yeah. Played on that record that you held up, and he played most of the shows in the in the late uh, summer and fall. And it'll be a mix and match. Kathy's coming back now that she's got the pesky virus beaten well, back a little she's, bit. She's but she's else. literally working uh, right now at uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital in Northampton. Uh, she went back when COVID hit, thinking they would need her. And there was not going to be any music industry to go straight to the top of anyway. And then it didn't get serious here for a while because we're podunk enough that they were twiddling their thumbs uh, for maybe a month or two when everybody else was getting nervous. But then they had a, a pretty serious run of it. But now the cases aren't gone, she says, but they're way less than what they were. They had a episode where people at the hospital were getting it from treating the patients and that complicated things but the the vaccination seems to be working a little bit um she's a fascinating person because i've met her is. a couple times she's come to the station with you yep. and um she is an er doctor she's a yes, the, she she's the real deal <laughs> and when she was in chicago she was telling us she played with a whole bunch of blues bands yep. when she was in Chicago. And I don't know how you find them, but you just stumble onto great people coming from Chicago to play I, in your band. That's pretty cool that you, you did that. I'm very fortunate in how nice the people that I have are and how good they play. Your boy, Steve Gates said, she's a doctor. I'm like, yeah. And then he said, and you're a professor. At that time, I was teaching at <laughs> Springfield Technical Community College. He says, this must be the only band of people who have real jobs that's any good. <laughs> and I, said, oh, I can't speak to that, Steve. But Kat, do you know what Kathy was before she was a doctor? No. She had a PhD in mechanical engineering. So there won't be any mansplaining to Kathy, wow. maybe about music. Like Emily will get going. Emily has an advanced degree in music, in jazz arranging, music theory. And Emily will, doesn't talk often, but I, if you drag it out of her, she'll start explaining advanced music theory. And you look over at Kathy and her eyes are as big as saucers. There's Emily right there on the cover. <laughs> yes, she is. And hey, if any of your listeners out there are in charge of a music program at a community college, a high school, uh, don't let Emily go back on that boat. Can I tell that story, John? Is that okay yeah, if I yeah, tell it? Yeah, go ahead. It's on the record. I have a little separate track because I think those spoken introductions get old quickly on a record. But uh, there, there is a track on there where I explain that when COVID hit, we had recorded an album. It was just coming out. And Emily, we weren't touring until the summer. And Emily uh, took a, a job on a cruise ship and they were in Asia when COVID hit and all the passengers immediately wanted to go home and the next group of passengers canceled and the group after that canceled. But what happened was they would let the passengers get off, but then they wouldn't let the crew or the musicians get off. They would let them refuel, but you can't come down the dock 
into the town. So they circled around in the Pacific Ocean for two months. And uh, finally, they're like, well, we were paying these musicians and this crew for a cruise that isn't making any money. And they're kind of getting sick of us. How are we going to get these people home? So they went through the Suez Canal. It is not Emily's fault that the Suez Canal got blocked. This was a year ago. But it isn't the safest place in the world on a good day. So they snaked through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean, thinking a European country will surely let them land. And the European country said, don't call us Shirley, and you can't land either. So they went around to Gibraltar, and Gibraltar let them disembark the band and some of the crew. They flew to England because Gibraltar is a British possession, and then they flew home. And there wasn't any summer tour by that time anyway, but she played – you know, the dates, what dates we had in the tent cities. Wow. You, who was it that had the album? It was one of the hard rocker bands had an album called Intensity in 10 Cities. Was that Ted Nugent? Ted Nugent. Was it? Okay. Well, I, I think my tour last summer should have been called Intensity in Tent Cities because every <laughs> restaurant out here had to have a giant tent. tent. On the side yep. With some tables set up. So tell the listening audience, Emily and, and, and my how I uh, was able to get her to talk one time. Oh, that's right. I almost got her to come over here today, but no, she's terrified of interviews. She has never done an interview. The only interview in the history of the world that she's ever agreed to speak on the radio was at your show when we came out. Was that after Deck of Cards, maybe? I know it was with Kathy, right? Is that yep. the same? But she actually said a few words on the air. So, Em, if you're out there, shout out to you. Shout out to DK and Mark, Mark Schwienard on the drums. Shout out to uh, Kathy. Maybe they'll have you on in the emergency room at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. I don't know if they'll allow. Well, I think because Kathy was there, em Emily said some stuff. So, oh, maybe. Yeah. Well, yeah, because they kind of look out for each each other. Yeah. Yeah, um, you you have you have quite the band. It's. Uh... <laughs> It, it's great. There, you have some great musicians in the band. Uh, I'm so pleased. That whole record that you're holding up, that's okay. I'm going to throw some ideas at M and see what she sends back with her. She has a great ear. She could probably send the stuff back on the fly like we do live. But uh, And uh, the other thing, John, and I, if you're if you got listeners out there who are starting out a band, if you're going to play blues music, which is a small niche, right? If you're going to play niche music and you're going to play some of your original material, yeah, you better not also have people in your band that ruffle the feathers of the club. And I, I never have to worry about that. I've had guys in my band where I was praying that they wouldn't get to the club before me, because if they did, I knew that the first impression of the club owner was going to be this. These guys are a bunch of jerks, but I never have to worry about that. My uh, my band are unfailingly polite. DK Kadarian is also unfailingly polite, and I get them to truck out here from Sturbridge. We're going to Sturbridge. No, we're going to East Brookfield in a couple weeks. Next wow. week we're in South Hadley. You don't even know where any of these places. I, I know are. where South Hadley you know where South is. Had That's near where the, where the. Uh, I know where Watley is too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That place is now a convenience store with like a giant empty barn behind. That was the tobacco shed. James Montgomery used to play there. But I'm gonna. I'll tell you a place. Yeah. You. I don't know if you. It's. I think it's in Goshen, Mass. Okay. It's the daughter of American Revolution. Oh, Camp yeah. Brown. Yep. I was just there. Some of my wife's relatives were visiting. And they wanted to go hiking, and we went there. I played there for a Northampton high school prom. They didn't want a prom. They wanted Woodstock that year. So they had an all-day, all-night event out in the woods. Like, I am driving in the dark hoping not to run over any naked bodies that are uh, getting to know each other in the tall grass because there's no road where I'm going. And I think we played at like 5 o'clock in the morning. 
uh, we should have played the Star Spangled Banner like Jimi Hendrix, right? Wasn't yeah. that why he did that? Because people yeah. were asleep when he came up? Yeah, he wanted them to wake up. It was <laughs> Monday well, morning, It was actually. like that. They were just starting to pass out too much uh, adult beverages. But that was the Northampton High School prom. I don't know what year that was, 81? So so tell me a story about John Lee Hooker. You you were telling me one time a story the about him. The hook. I'm told that uh, later on he would pull this little trick on every opening band, but – when he came to me, he had an Epiphone, um, that 335 looking Epiphone that he liked. Uh, why can't I think of what the model name? But he had one of those with the neck busted off of it. And he said the airlines had damaged it. Could he borrow my guitar? So at that time, I had a Gibson 355, like a BB King guitar with a little veritone knob. And uh, I was adjusted that constantly i never really did get that thing to where i liked it so i loaned him that and when he finished his show he handed it back to me and five of the six strings were not in the bridge saddles anymore they were in between <laughs> the bridge saddles and i'm like this man strikes the guitar rather firmly um another time in connecticut we opened for john and uh and he said to me in the dressing room, uh, and I don't want to do my horrible, my horrible John Lee imitation because I don't think that's sensitive to the current situation with the racial poison in the United States. But he said to me, I know Robert Johnson was a better blues player than me, but he did. So what good's that doing him? <laughs> <laughs> and we went, well, OK, there's unflappable logic. The one that I think I've told you before is a night in Northampton where he came to me and said, I, I need I need you play longer. Start late and play longer than they told you. And I'm like, John, they never asked the opening act to start late and play longer. That's a good way to get fired. He said, I need you to do that. He had just uh, picked up his New England band uh, that day, and he didn't know how many things they knew. I think it was not the King Snakes, not our King Snakes, but the ones from upstate New York, and they were perfectly fine as a band, but he didn't know that. So he wanted to start late and play like nine songs and get off. Uh, wow. But the hook, I hope he's up in heaven praying for us. I learned a lot from watching, watching him. Uh, they would lead him out to a chair and hand him the guitar, and he would sit down until the last song. He would jump up and stand up, and the audience would gasp like they didn't know he could stand up. When I first met him, he was 54, John. He had had a hard life, but he was 15 years younger than I am right now while I'm talking to you. I haven't started doing the frail act yet, but I'm saving that for when I'm really old. That's great. That's a great little story. The hook? Yeah. The hook was, was awesome. And who else? The, the Blues Brothers movie came out. All of a sudden, he would bring his band from Oakland. His like number one band would do all the shows for a while uh, with Deacon Jones on the keyboards. And that band was un uncanny. You know, he would change on seven and a half bars, and they'd all change right with him. And I'd be, how? The next night, he'd change on six bars, and they'd all be right with him. Yeah, just like Bob Dylan does. Call calls the song and... <laughs> Plays it, and then the, they're supposed to follow him. It's not easy. Yeah. Right. We all want to be what we're not. I got a theory that Bob Dylan want, wishes he was uh, John Lee Hooker. Like, you know, like he can play a little blues, but I think, you know, if, like if he could write songs like Sonny Boy Williamson, Fattening Frogs for Snakes and Dead Presidents, I think that would really be the ultimate thing for Bob. So you can't quite get there. Out of all the people you've opened for, what was the most memorable? Uh, people still talk to me about playing in Bo Diddley's backup band. Uh, and that was a great show, a very successful show. But I have to say that wasn't my favorite because Bo spent most of the show screaming at the drummer that he wasn't playing the Bo Diddley beat right. <laughs> uh, although, although about two-thirds of the way through the show, Bo goes up to the microphone and he says, 
boy, we are having a great time here tonight, but I'm getting a little thirsty. And the problem is I only drink Grand Marnier. Well, even then, Grand Marnier was about $14 a shot in a bar in Northampton. Even then, this was probably 1985 or six. So 42 people sent shots of Grand Marnier up to the stage because <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to say they bought Baudelaire a drink. Wouldn't you want to say that? Yeah. So, uh, That's a lot of money. People couldn't drink all that, so I'm passing like three to the bass player and two to the drummer. Think about how much money that is. <laughs> yeah, right. The bar's thinking, this is the best show ever. Look at the cash register. Yeah. Um, the question is, was, next week, was Bo getting paid enough money on top of all the <laughs> drinking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't know. But uh, drummer quit the next week. The last show that we did was with Ronnie Earl. I heard you play with some Ronnie, Ronnie Earl and uh, Jerry Portnoy. And that was in this little dungeon in a basement in Northampton called Sheehan's. And Jerry almost went home. He did not. He did not care for the professional surroundings of Sheehan's basement, and uh, uh, and I'm like, uh, my drummer is quitting after tonight, and the bass player is a sub, and we're just doing the best we can for you. <laughs> but uh, so the most memorable, which one was it? You said most Bo memorable. I'd have to say any one of those James Cotton shows, John, just because. From top to bottom, that band was so killer. If your listeners went on uh, YouTube and looked up Live and on the Move from Shabu in Connecticut, that's a similar show to what they used to do. Um, but, you know, I've opened for people who were more famous. I've opened for the Stray Cats. I've opened for Greg Allman. But those cotton shows, I just could not believe how tight that band was and how the uh, the pulse of all the different rhythms kept it changing for the audience, kept the show moving. And, you know, Cotton was amazing. Towards the end, when he was losing his voice, he would just do an acoustic show with just him and Luther Tucker. And Luther broke a string just before the part where he was going to have my bass player and drummer come up. So we all went up. I went up. Um, and Katie Wright says she was outside parking the car because she was one of those people who doesn't come to see the opening act, <laughs> but <laughs> she hears Cotton playing and she goes, Oh, Cotton got a new guitar player and he's really good. <laughs> um, I used to take advantage. I still do. I, I get a lot of free promotion from Katie out here in this part of the world. One time I had to pretend to be my wife so that I could take some pictures in the dressing room with the hook. Wow. And uh, then at the end of the show, John was hitting on my real wife. And when she said, oh, I can't go to the motel with you, I'm married to this fella. He looked at me and he said something along the lines of, what are you, a Mormon? <laughs> but, but whatever. But any cotton show, the one where I got to play with, with him, uh, with my man behind him, although... You know how thick his Mississippi accent was. Yeah. Um, he turns and says, give me a Jimmy Reed. And he starts counting it off. And the band is looking at me like, what the, what did he just say? And I'm like, that's a shuffle. That's a shuffle to you. Let's quickly talk about your latest release. You can't Let's, fall off the floor. Uh, I did market research, by which I mean... I put three or four titles up on Facebook and asked my friends which one they liked the best. That's not the best song on the album, but they definitely liked that it, best. It, that's why it won, right? Yeah. The, the Can't Fall Off the Floor. Um, why would you start a record with a seven-minute Holland Wolf cover? That's not radio smart, is it? But it's the end of the world, John. We didn't care. And that... That first song, I'm throwing Beatles songs at Emily, and she's playing them back to me. I'm throwing Walking Through the Park. I forget all, I, but stuff that we would do live, screwing around. I'm throwing all that stuff at her in the studio, and she's playing it right back to me. Um, I got my tribute to, 
to Mike Bloomfield on there, Marianne. Uh, I have a couple of new songs of mine and a couple of recycled ones. I thought the I'm too big to cry, so I might as well laugh might be appropriate to our current situation. So I put that one on there. Um, oh. Angel of Mercy that I, that Play. I spoiled by playing on this thing. Hey, I want you to see this thing, though. Uh, this Vox amp is weird. It's one of the – it was made in California, but it wasn't solid state. It was – they actually copied the tube charts that they got sent from Vox in England. So it's analog. Yeah, but they did that only for about less than a year. But it's an interesting sounding amp, and I did use it on the record. And it has a lot of bass on it. So that's where the Pirate Queen song came from, was me fooling around with this amplifier going, wow, I, that bass is almost turned all the way off, and it's still kind of... It has kind of a cool reverb, I don't know. Yeah, it sounds great. So, um, I don't know, but there's some new songs on there, a couple of uh, greatest hits ones, and, uh, oh, and Johnny Copeland, right? A lot of radio stations been playing uh, Devil Hand, which is a Johnny Copeland uh, cover. One of the few positives in 2020 was uh, Johnny Copeland got in the Blues Hall of Fame. That's Shamika's father to... Yeah. your younger listeners. But uh, Shamika's voice is so powerful, they only give her a microphone because it's stylish. <laughs> I've seen her walk up into the second deck of the Iron Horse in Northampton without the microphone, and you could still hear her just as loud as the band. Well, Johnny Copeland was at least as powerful as that, maybe more so. And uh, I, uh, one of my buddies out here, a Buddy McEarns, who did the artwork on that record, uh, and he has a band out here. I'll hook you up with him sometime. But uh, I sent my demo of that over to him, and I said, I'm aware that I can't sing in the in the uh, level of, of Johnny Copeland, but I really like this song, and uh, do you think I can do it? And he encouraged me to give it a shot. So I'm I screaming pretty good by the end, but uh, that's – that's on three compared to Johnny. Johnny's going crazy at the end. That dog, oh, devil, wrecked my life like a hurricane. <laughs> I remember Johnny Johnny Copeland. I saw him many times in the eight, late 80s and 90s. Yeah. And uh, one time I saw him when when he had a pacemaker, but it was outside, not inside. Oh, he yeah. Was, he was playing with the pacemaker, flapping yeah. away as he's playing. Yeah, that's the blues right there, John. Um, yeah. The first heart attack, uh, we were scheduled to play with him in Northampton, and uh, he didn't. He didn't come. He, that was before the before the pacemaker that you're talking about. And then he, he had like at least one or two more and died. Right? Still yeah. touring. Oh yeah, he never yeah. stopped. I saw him at the House of Blues, maybe a couple weeks before he died. Oh. And he was still he was still playing. He did not did not stop. Yeah, he I was he's up in heaven praying for all of he us. He was too. he uh, was something else. He I'm telling you, he I saw him I saw him with that pacemaker at Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel, and okay. it, yeah, there you go, Heartbreak Hotel, with, with, sure. of all places, right? <laughs> Nobody appreciated the irony except you, apparently. right? And uh, and then you know that was. He was something else. And Shamika opened for him. That was oh, when, right. They did that for a while. Yeah. For a while. Right. She I remember fondly of that sometimes when she's on the air on uh Sirius. And uh he was he was something else. I mean, he he die hard to the end. He had to play. He I, I bet you if he dropped on stage, he would have been happy. Yeah, well, God bless him. With that horrible PV guitar. <laughs> PVT90. Buddy, Buddy McGurn said to me, oh, that guitar is very underrated. I said, that guitar is horrible. I mean, he could get it to do things. He could get it to do he things. Was, he was, was the Texas the Twister, Twister, as they say. Texas <laughs> Twister. That's what um, they called him. And late in life, when he did that record um, with Robert Cray and Albert Collins, I hope he finally made some money, you know? Showdown, yeah. Showdown, yeah. 
Well, how do people find out about your music where they can buy merchandise and things? All right. They would go to www.wildcatohalloran. You got to spell a horrible long Irish last name. You can spell wildcat though, probably, right? Yeah. One, la one last question. Yeah. How'd you get the name Wildcat? Who gave it to you? Did you give it to you? Oh, uh, Lupe's Heartbreak Hotel. I almost uh, told you that I was a friar. Um, I went to college at Providence College in beautiful Providence, Rhode Island. That's before, I'm so old, that's before Lupe's was even uh, open. But uh, I was Wild Bill for you know a long time, and then I was Wild Willie. And then I was wild man, and then I was wild guy, but that sounded swishy. And then I experimented, <laughs> and finally I decided I was going to be wild cat to see if that would work. Because when I was doing those shows in uh, with the Hook and uh, Cotton and James Montgomery, uh, my harmonica player was taking lessons from a guy named Mad Cat Ruth. Uh, played with uh, Dave Brubeck's kid Chris. Chris Brubeck, they had a couple albums on Columbia, and uh, they came out and sat in with us one time. Mad Cat Ruth would play with, like, the microphone taped to his hand and three harmonicas, and he could change keys and stuff. So I decided I was going to be Wildcat O'Halloran and see if that would work, and I've been Wildcat for a long time now. That's, that's good. So yeah. you had a whole bunch of names, and it ended up being Wildcat after yeah, all. Wild Willie doesn't sound very impressive, but whatever. The other thing I, I want your company tell me I I should change my name to Billy T or something like that. I'm like, no, not doing that. The other but thing anybody I needs a stupid nickname to get through life, John. That's a oh wait. Why it's it's helped you out. People, yeah. People the know you by that it, name. The best thing about it is when drunk girls tried to look me up in the phone book, they couldn't find me because they couldn't spell that last name. There you go. But if you're looking for me online, uh, if you get Wildcat O H something something, it'll probably find me. There's not a lot of other grown up little wildcats running around. So you have a website. You're on Facebook. Yes. Facebook. Uh, it's I what? Www. Www. com or Wildcat O'Halloran? No, Wildcat O'Halloran. It was already long enough, John. Uh, <laughs> O h a l l o r a n dot com it doesn't have the uh, apostrophe in it. I don't know if you can put apostrophes in in uh, website names. Well, that's but, uh, great. There's stuff on there. There's music. There's videos. Um, there's uh, supposedly you can buy albums and uh, t-shirts and hoodies. Uh, if that site doesn't work, would you please? Yell at me over Facebook Messenger because um, CD Baby is in disrepair. Although they they're back to supposedly selling actual discs again, but uh, you know it's hard out there. I saw a post from Duke Robillard a couple of weeks ago saying he had twenty five thousand streams on Spotify, and they sent him five dollars and twenty five cents. Wow. <laughs> Uh, that's the next song I'm going to bring back. You know I have one where where uh, the music business, they told me the music business never going to change. Well, and I you, guess what they say is true. Yeah, it's you, not on there. Though. You got Facebook U on here. That's close Facebook enough. Facebook U. I'm amazed I didn't get in more trouble about that. But the key line in that is if my friends want to tell me something stupid, they're going to have to drive right over to my house because I've heard more misinformation on that goddamn thing even after they started censoring people, boy, there's a lot of myths and legends that get presented as fact on there. Uh, you know, for me, if I want to, if I want health news, I call up Kathy Peterson. Uh, Before we go, you want to yeah. mention some upcoming gigs you got coming? I know there's a sure. couple. Sure. Sure. A, a week from today, I'm at the Drunken Rabbit Brewing Company in South Hadley, Mass., for an outdoor patio show. Uh, Which isn't far have, from Springfield. It's uh, next to Chicopee, if that makes sense to you. Remember that Johnny Cash song where he's been everywhere? 
well, he included Chickabee because he wanted to explain that he literally had been everywhere, but right next to Chickabee is South Hadley. Where, so the Drunken Rabbit. Following week, we're in uh, East Brookfield at the Timberyard Brewing Company. Then I think we have a week off, and then we're at the Shootsbury Athletic Club. You can't find that place, John. That's out in the woods. That was literally a softball team that needed a bar to go to after games. So they invented one. When's the Gardner Alehouse coming back so you can play there again? Uh, Steve Gates says not yet. Uh, we've been – I messaged him this week because we've been – a few times to uh, to the bull run, and their outdoor setup is pretty nice. Maybe uh, maybe he'll message me soon this week. I, I don't know. Um, so I forget everything, but, uh, you know, we're around. We're back in the tent cities. Well, that's we'll go great. down to Theodore's and just play outside to their tables. they they're right in the city, and there's no room for the giant tent, so they have like. Well, those are the two big ones outside. The two big ones, Theodore's and the Iron Horse. You can't beat either one of them. Iron Horse said if they were to try to ramp up to do shows, it would take months of planning. And I'm like, that doesn't sound like a good idea, but it's not for me to say. And you know, it depends on what the governor does, right? If we beat back the virus a little more, maybe we open up a little more. Well, you get the you got black eyed Sally's in Connecticut that I don't know if they're doing anything right yet, but they were pretty busy at one time. Yeah, I don't know either. There's a couple of outdoor places in Connecticut. Uh, I don't have connections there right now, but maybe when they see this show, there you maybe go. I'll get some phone calls. And that if box. you're out there and you're a music educator and you need a saxophone teacher, you gotta message me. Because I can't believe that Emily's considering another stint on the boat uh, after what she went through the last time. But she's so even-tempered that I said to her, were you bored? And she went, eh, not really. Were you angry? Eh, not really. She were travels a lot. Eh, not really. And I'm like, I wish I had your temperament. I would have been all three of those things after <laughs> about a week of driving around in circles. <laughs> but whatever. That's crazy. Two all right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And when we're back in the studio, I want you to come in with your wonderful band. Yeah, 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 we will. We will do. All right. All right. Gonna, I'm going to feature this new CD in a, in a few minutes. How's that? Awesome. I can get you on their interweb here. Yes, I, you can. Uh, yep. So um, I'll hear that record. And right. uh, if uh, you get death threats, you're going to let me know. I will. <laughs> All right. Thank Have you. a good one. You Bye -bye too. Now. Bye-bye.